The temples of the Angkor Archaeological Park bear witness to the life of the Khmer people. All the glory, the love, the fighting, and the heartbreak, which has played out over thousands of years. Welcome to our travel adventure of Angkor, the seat of power for the ancient Khmer people. We are 18 weeks away from home now and settled into Siem Reap for a 21-day immersion into the past, present, and future of the capital megacity which flourished from the 9th to the 15th centuries. We are a Canadian family of four exploring the world for a year. We are planning on visiting four continents, 18 countries, and 32 cities. Follow along for weekly videos posted every Sunday. Don't forget to hit subscribe on my channel devoted to creative wandering. In addition to videos about travel and creative projects, Soon, there will be details about my first retreat. I would love to hear from you in the comments section below this video. You can also shoot me an email or connect with me on any of my social channels. If you watched part one of our tour of Angkor, you know that while there is so much to see, the adventure can easily be broken up into days, making the journey far more pleasant and manageable. Our second tour day was at the granddaddy of them all, Angkor Wat. The expansive temple complex is the largest religious monument in the world. It was originally constructed as a Hindu temple of the god Vishnu for the Khmer Empire, gradually transforming into a Buddhist temple towards the end of the 12th century. By now, you will see the pattern for the temple building at Angkor. Other buildings were constructed by kings who wanted to please their Hindu gods. Later renovations, additions, and structures were devoted to Buddhism. But the whole effort, which required a massive amount of human labor, only benefited a few. Very few normal people ever graced the halls of these sacred buildings, which is quite a contrast to today when the numbers of tourists are overwhelming. Angkor Wat is the best preserved temple of them all, as it is the only one to not be abandoned. Even today, it is not uncommon to see working monks. It has become a symbol of Cambodia appearing on the national flag, and it is the country's prime attraction for visitors. This is the one temple complex where there are splashes of color playing against the stark shades of grey. There is also the highly anticipated sunrise, which draws a fantastic number of tourists out of bed every morning. We decided to visit around 2 p.m., late in the day by temple touring standards. The crowds were somewhat smaller. We even found a small corner of the library and had a little rest, all to ourselves. Towards the end of the day, it was time to feed the monkeys. It is worth noting that the popularity of Angkor Wat specifically is putting a strain on local resources. The high frequency of tourism and growing demand for quality accommodations in the area, such as the development of a large highway, has had a direct effect on the underground water table, subsequently straining the structural stability of the temples at Angkor Wat, the very thing the tourists are here to see. Locals of Siem Reap have also complained that the charm and atmosphere of their town have been compromised in order to entertain tourists. But since that local atmosphere is a key component of the tourist experience, the local officials continue to discuss how to incorporate future tourism without sacrificing the local values and culture. Our third day took us back towards Angkor Thom to the temple of Preah Khan, which was built in the 12th century for King Jayavarman VII to honor his father. Located northeast of Angkor Thom, it was the center of a substantial organization with almost 100,000 officials and servants. The temple has been left largely unrestored, with numerous trees and other vegetation growing among the ruins. After negotiating with our tuk-tuk driver, it was agreed that he would drive us to Tenai rather than letting us walk. 
Located deep in the jungle of Angkor, this is an ideal temple for the adventurous traveler. No surprise, this was Grant's favorite spot. The handful of wanderers that visit Tanai are not hassled by peddlers or interrupted by the voices of excited travelers. The temple rewards them with the same charm that affected the early Angkor explorers. Archaeologists have left Tanai as it originally was, for the most part. Tree roots split open the temple stone and jungle flora sprawled out across the temple grounds. Tanai has been the object of minimal reconstruction and clearing efforts. Our third day of temple going wrapped up with Tapram, or the Tomb Raiders Temple, made famous by the Angelina Jolene movie. Tapram is in much the same condition in which it was found. The photogenic and atmospheric combination of trees growing out of the ruins and the jungle surroundings have made it one of Angkor's most popular temples with visitors. The temple's stone and wooden slab records show that the site was home to more than 12,500 people, including 18 high priests and 615 dancers, with an additional 800,000 souls in the surrounding villages working to provide services and supplies. The temple amassed considerable riches, including gold, pearls, and silks. More examples of a huge number of Khmer people working to satisfy the needs of a few. I can't tell whether this was a voluntary way of spending one's life, or if this was a hardship. I'm currently reading a novel called A Woman of Angkor by John Burgess. It is a work of fiction which revives the rites and rhythms of ancient culture that built the temples of Angkor, then abandoned them to the jungle. I guess I'll have to keep reading to see if my answers have questions, at least in the form of fiction. Our fourth day was spent at a complex known as the Rulios Group. These are some of the earliest permanent structures built by the Khmer. They mark the beginning of the classical period of Khmer civilization, dating from the late 9th century. Lole was our first stop of the day and we found it in poor condition. The temple towers were constructed with brick and only small carvings and reliefs were made of sandstone. Originally, the towers were enclosed by an outer wall with access through a gopura, but neither the wall nor gopura have survived to the present. Today, the temple is next to a monastery, just as in the 9th century, it was next to an ashrama. Next up was Preako, which consists of six brick towers arranged in two rows of three towers, each perched on a sandstone platform. The towers faced east, and the front central tower is the tallest. The sanctuaries are dedicated to three divinized forefathers of Indra Varaman and their respective wives. There is an active restoration going on, financed by the German government. While this site is also constructed in brick, the sandstone carvings have survived the passage of time a little better. Then the mighty Bakong, the first temple mountain of sandstone constructed by the rulers of the Khmer Empire. In the final decades of the 9th century AD, it served as the official state temple of King Indravaraman I. Bakong enjoyed its status as the state temple of Angkor for only a few years, but later additions from the 12th or 13th centuries testify that it was not abandoned. Though the pyramid at one time must have been covered with bas-reliefs, carvings and stucco, today only fragments remain. Large stone statues of elephants are positioned as guardians at the corners of the three lower levels of the pyramid. Statues of lions guard the stairways. Thanks for watching part two of our temple tour. This has been the best history lesson a person could ever ask for. But I think there is a price for our footsteps here that we have not paid for. I've been careful to take photos which are pretty much devoid of people, patiently waiting for my turn in the hot sun. What we have not shown are the hordes of tourists. Some temples are far less crowded than others, but it is important to understand the load of people before you set out. And it makes me wonder about the sustainability of it all. I'm not sure what the right way is to manage this treasure, but over time, things will have to change. For now, we had free access to anything we wanted to see, which ended up being 10 different temple sites. With our seven day pass, the price was a mere 72 US dollars each. Such a small price to pay for a rewarding experience. Thanks for watching. For more information about our trip and creative inspiration in general, head over to dailycreatives.com. You can find links to my three favorite things, books, videos, and courses. I update the blog two times per week with my thoughts on all things creative. See you over there.